the sign up form. Most applications are going to have some method of signing up their users. So we're going to go through a lot of the common steps that you would take. Uh, and we're going to look at the three pillars coming together in a start to finish experience. We'll look at the data structure necessary for the user account, the front end design that the, the new user would be experiencing when they're filling in their details and they're clicking on a button and the workflow logic to connect the two together and actually create that new user record in the database. Okay, so this is the sign up form that I'm going to be rebuilding from scratch from a blank page uh, so that you can see how it all comes together. This is a design I had done ahead of time so you can understand what the goal, what the end result is going to be. Um, but basically what we've got here is a sign up form with a couple inputs, a button for the user to click and actually trigger a workflow, sign up the user, um, and an image over here on the right. And I've actually got some conditional logic to hide this image once the user is on a smaller device size so that it's not really in the way. One thing I want you to be mindful of, just take a look here at the layout of this page so that we can start to make decisions about how we're going to set up our container styles. At the page level, I'm really looking at one giant row, right? If we look at the entire left side, this whole white section, that is one block in our row of two blocks, the white and the blue, the light blue, okay? Now inside of this white block, I have another container. You can actually see the border, right? Which is much smaller. It kind of centers the group a little bit, centers the form. And this container is actually set up in a column structure. You see how all of the elements inside of that container stack vertically. We have the welcome, sign up, email, input, password, all of it's vertical. We have two other row configurations inside of our overall column, right, within this line here, okay? If these were within the parent column, the forgot password text would fall below this checkbox, but they're actually next to each other on the same line. So there's another container in there to kind of isolate those two elements and put them in their own row so that they can be side by side on the same line. Same thing is happening here for the already have an account text and the login. So just be mindful of that layout. These are the kinds of things that you want to think about when you are putting together your initial layouts is kind of get a rough picture of um, the, the rows and columns that you're, you're forming through your visual elements because you're really going to start from the container level and then work your way in. And that's going to keep your development more efficient. Okay, so let's head over to the editor. Let's create a new page and I'm going to call this uh, sign up demo two. My first one is currently being taken up by the existing demonstration. So we're going to start from a blank page here. I'm going to hit create. And I have my new page. So I first want to do a couple of settings at the page level. So if I open up the property editor for this page, head over to the layout tab, I'm going to move away from that default fix setting and I'm going to set the page to a row layout style. So now anything I add, remember anything I add to my page is going to fall in a row. They're going to stack horizontally. So my first elements within my row are going to be two big containers, that white group and on the left and then the light blue group on the right. So I'm just going to draw an initial setting here. We're going to change the widths and all of that in a moment. And let's do um, another group. I'm just going to copy and paste. So you can see these are side by side like that, group A and B. Okay, open up my elements tree. Now I'm going to give them some names so they're easier for us to identify. We're going to say group left like that, and over here, group right. And I'll change the colors, the background colors of these groups so that um, you know we have some of that styling happening. So I'll remove the default style, which is just a transparent group. There's no background color to it. And I'll give it a flat color of white. And then this one, I'm going to remove the style as well, give it a flat color of that light blue. Maybe I'll start here, maybe take this down just a little bit. It's not gonna be a perfect match, but we'll get kind of close. There we go. Okay, so there's my left group and then there's my right group. Now, let's talk about the widths of these containers. If I go into the layout setting of this group, I don't really have a lot of control over dynamic widths. I can set up a fixed width or a fixed height. And the reason I can only do fixed is because the group itself is set to a fixed container layout. Um, I wanna change this layout to one of my responsive settings. Now, this container is going to be an align to parent because the element inside of this container is going to be my form with that border around it. Okay. 
Um, let's go ahead and add that so we can start to see that coming together. And then I'll go back to the widths, right? So I'm just going to drag this form like this here. Um, and we're going to call this group form. Okay, and group form is going to sit in the center of group left. Group form is in the center of group left. Let's go to the elements tree. So you can see here, group form is inside of group left and it's in the center. With group form, I'm gonna give it some borders. Okay, so let's do, I'm just removing the style and all of this so you can see where the, the settings really happen with the appearance properties. So let's do a solid border, um, give it some roundness on the corners of 10 pixels. And it's a thickness of one pixel on the border. I can of course increase it. I don't want it to be that obvious, just a subtle border. And I'll take down the color of the border a bit so it's more light lighter it's lighter in color <laughs> that was a weird way to say that uh let me remove real quick here under grid and borders the um bubble has a way for you to kind of always see the boundaries of all of your elements when you have this turned on which is helpful i tend to have this on uh, but i'm going to turn this off for a moment so that you can see what the actual visual properties are when the user's looking at it okay so here we have our left group in white right group in the light blue, and then a center group, which I've called group form with the border around it. You know what I wanna do is I think I wanna change the size of my page. I'm gonna go over to the layout and change the preset page width to full width. Get a little bit more width there. And this full width is great for desktop size applications. Again, understanding that we are building this with the responsive engine enabled. So um, even if I'm on a smaller screen, things are going to compress down, but this feels a little bit more comfortable for me since I am working on um, a larger screen anyway. So notice that there's now some space over here on the right. We're not filling the whole frame. Whereas in our example, everything is fully filling the frame. So we're gonna get to that um, in a moment here. Okay, so back to my group left. Okay, which contains my group form. This group left currently has a fixed width setting. Now I have some controls now. I have more controls over changing the widths and the heights because I changed it to a responsive setting. Remember before when it was fixed, I only had fixed settings. Now that it is an aligned to parent, I can change this a little bit more. I'm gonna remove the fixed width setting. I don't want it fixed to 479. I want it to adapt to different screen sizes. So I'll uncheck this and it's gonna maintain that, that what was previously the fixed width, now it's gonna move it over to the minimum width, which means that bubble's gonna make it at least that wide. And if I'm on a smaller screen, it's still gonna be at least that wide, so things could get cut off. So I'm gonna remove the minimum width, okay? So now it is fully dynamic. As long as there is space for this white group to exist, it's going to expand as much as possible. And even if I take down the page size super, super narrow, it's going to continue to compress down. Okay, but I don't necessarily want it to be just fully extendable like this because I also have this blue group on the right. Now let's update this one here real quick as well. I'm going to change this to uh, align to parent so that the image inside, we don't have that quite yet, but the image will sit inside in the center. And I'm also going to remove the fix width setting and remove the minimum width. Okay, so now that they're both dynamic, they're, can, they're taking up equal parts within the page, right? They're both elements in the row at the page level. I want to give the form a little bit more room. I wanna prioritize the form and make the size of this space here for the image be less. I don't need as much space for this here. So this group on the left, I'm gonna have it max out Okay, percentage wise, you can do things either by pixel or by percentage, max out at 60% of its most immediate parent. In this case, it's the page. And this group here is going to max out at 40% of its parent. So you see now this is taking up 60% of the space. This one's taking up 40%. You don't have to go off of percentages. You can go off of pixels. You also don't even have to be specific in this way, but I wanted this type of look where the form is always gonna be more dominant in the space it takes up on the page. And so I'm only allowing this blue group to go 40% of the parent, which is the page, okay? Um, and if I go into my responsive viewer here and just kind of preview, you see how that the, the ratio of the 60 to 40 percentages 
it, it stays put, right? As I expand or contract the page, they're always going to be 60 to 40% relative to whatever the page's overall width is, okay? All right, so now let's look at this group here. This is our form. We're going to need more space than this. This form is still set to a fixed setting, so the elements inside of the form right now are fixed. I want to change this to a column. So we've actually matched, mix and matched three different layout styles. The page is a row, this left group is an aligned to parent, and the form group is a column. Now the column is what's going to have all the content inside with my text and my inputs. Okay, so let's give this um, width a little bit more room. Let's remove the fixed width setting. And maybe I just want to max this out at, uh, let's say 400 pixels, something like that. We might end up adjusting this. And let me turn on my element borders here, but this is gonna be a good place for us to start. Notice how I have not touched inputs or buttons. I am starting with the containers. It might feel boring, it might feel a little tedious, but I promise you it's gonna save you so much time if you are if you take care of the the foundation of your designs right you're 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 basically putting together building blocks so that once it comes time to adding the buttons and the inputs they are exactly where you want them to be on the page right layout wise position wise so okay so let's start adding some elements now that we have a form that is giving us enough space here i've maxed it to 400 pixels um, and i'm going to start with a text like this and we're gonna say, welcome, okay? And this is gonna be, I'm gonna change the styling a little bit. I'm gonna up the font size. Um, let's make this a heavier font weight, maybe the medium, maybe one more than that, semi-bold. Okay, now you might be tempted to do things like center the text here inside of this, you know, these boundaries of the text element. Um, or maybe increase the size so that it fills the element boundaries. What I want you to prioritize is under the layouts here, the width and height settings, the responsive width and height settings. So I'm gonna take away the fixed width setting. I'm gonna take away the minimum width. Okay, you see how when I took away the, the, the fixed, now because there's no max, it expands the full width of its parent because there's no max. We're telling Bubble, hey, have it grow as far as you can within its parent. And that's what's happening there. Um, if I said I want the max to be 300 pixels, then it stops at 300 pixels, right? Um, what I'm gonna do instead though is remove the minimum like this and have it fit to the content. So welcome is a certain number of characters and it only needs that much width. If my content was bigger, right? So if I said welcome to the app like this, the boundaries of that text element are gonna grow with it, grow with the content. So you're gonna have more control over your elements position and spacing relative to other elements. If you generally have things, for, as far as text goes especially, generally have things fitting to content. Now, not everything needs to fit to content. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to fix things or have certain minimums um, or maximums. Uh, but with text, I see a lot of people kind of using the font adjustments when really they should be working with the boundaries of the element uh, and changing those widths and heights. So the same thing for the height. I'm going to remove the minimum height and now you can see the boundaries of that is perfectly around the text. So I'm not having any extra space happening here that I would have to account for if I'm going to introduce other elements that need to be spaced around it as well. So I'm going to center this now like this and I'm going to duplicate the text. I'm just using my keyboard shortcut and I'm going to say sign up below to oops sign up below to get started and I'll take this one to a lower weight maybe regular oops regular and then maybe a smaller font size let's go to 14. Okay so we have more of a heading and then kind of a subheading there. Next thing I'm going to do are going to create my my inputs with the labels. So I'm going to copy this text here and give this a label of email address and add an input, okay, about that, that wide. Um, I'm not gonna have a placeholder here because I like to have my input labels outside so the user always sees the label. Um, placeholders are a way for you to create basically instructions or helper text sample values that are gonna be faded in the input and then as soon as they type in, it just goes over that. But once they type over it, they kind of lose their label, so I like to have labels outside. 
Okay, so this is going to be my email input. I'm going to make sure to label this email address so that I can identify it when I'm working in the workflows. And this is going to be format email address. With regular inputs like this, uh, there's a number of different formats that Bubble can accept and in some cases may even show different formatting to the user. So if you have the currency, for example, Bubble's going to show your currency symbol um, or decimals. It will actually show the decimals with a password. It will um, conceal the password with the dots. So just depending on what kind of content you anticipate to be entered in here, just pay attention. You might have a special type of formatting uh, that you'll want to select. Email specifically need to be set up as email so Bubble understands that it, it is an email address. There's a lot of special things you can do with email addresses. Okay. Now, right now everything is just kind of vertically down the center. I want to group together my email input and this, sorry, my email address label and this input. So what I'm going to do is multi-select this text and this input by holding down my shift key. I'm going to click this one first, hold down shift, then click this one. And they're both selected as you can see. And I can either click on this kind of action button here. I can group them in a fixed container or I can help myself by right clicking, saving myself one step and grouping in a column container. You can group in different containers right here. I'm going to do that group in a column container. So it's going to think about it. So now I have another container inside of my group form, right? Here's the text. There's the sign up text. And then here's my new group. I'm going to call this group email. Okay. Very important to label as you go. It'll keep you very organized. Now this group can be set up a little bit differently if I want. So for example, uh, the email address text, I might want this left aligned so that it's to the left of, right, if we look at our demo here real quick, right, you see how these are centered technically in the form group, but the label is left aligned um, on, top of, on top of that input. Now that I have this label and input pair organized how I want it generally within this group, I'm going to copy that whole group, right? I'm gonna just use my shortcut, control C, and then control V. Now I have a duplicate and I can more quickly create the next input, which is gonna be the password. Password is the label and then this input, I will change this to password like that. Okay, let's create the next um, section here, which is the remember me and forgot password text. So I'm gonna help myself a little bit just by getting started with a new group, just because of the sizing so that I have the same widths and I'll remove this input um, let's say this is the forgot password text uh, and we'll change the color of this to really highlight it for the user. I'm going to change the weight of the text uh, and this needs to be a part of a row, right? If I add my checkbox, let's search for checkbox over here and add this to this group, they're going to stack in a column. I want them to be in a row so that they're in one single line. Um, let me move the checkbox ahead of the, you know, before the forgot password. So I'll just shift it over. Remember, I can use these texts here like that. Okay. Now I'm going to change this container to a row container. So now they stack horizontally next to each other. Let me rem rem remember to rename my groups here. This is group password and this one's going to be group uh, checkbox and forgot like that. Okay. So this row, which contains these two elements, I'm going to set up the alignment so that there is space between them. That way this text is all the way to the right. And this checkbox is all the way to the left. Let's give our checkbox a label. This was the remember me checkbox. And I don't necessarily want the width of that checkbox to extend past it. I don't really need that. So I'm going to update the width settings of this checkbox, turn that off, remove the minimum and have it fit to content. Same thing for the height. I'm just going to remove the minimum height. So it fits perfectly around that checkbox. And you can see that this group is also much taller than I really need it to be. Um, so at the group level, I'm also going to remove this minimum height that was just kind of created by default. Um, there we go. So we have our elements here. Now you'll notice that I'm waiting until the end to create my spacing between everything. Um, a lot of times I want to just focus more on the configuration of the layouts of all my specific elements. 
and then clean up with all of the spacing because oftentimes those things get changed as you go anyway. Um, so just trying to keep my development more efficient here. The next thing is going to be the sign up button. Okay, so let's create a button here. This is gonna say sign up like this and the layout, I want to center it horizontally. You can see that the width of this button is a little bit wider than my inputs. We're gonna address that in a moment. Right now, I just want the sign up button in there. Okay, the next thing I wanna add is the um, other row. Let's actually go over to our preview here. Yes, the already have an account and then the login text. And it's gonna be kind of similar to this uh, remember me and forgot password. So I'm gonna take that group and paste it as well. You see how it pasted it right after the thing that I copied from, so I can shift it down past the sign up button. I could have also picked it up and reorganized it. You see that bar there, that horizontal bar bubble showing me where this would be positioned if I just dropped it um, anywhere there in the group. So I'm gonna put it there. Um, and I'm gonna have this say, what was it? It was login and then already have an account. So let's actually get rid of the checkbox because these are two, gonna be two texts. So this is already have an account like this, and this is gonna be log in like this. Uh, I believe this one was uh, more in the style of our labels and this text here. One thing I can do is copy this uh, formatting. So copy formatting and then paste the formatting on this text like this. So now I don't have to go through and do all the same settings. It's a quick little shortcut for me. Now, in my previous design, you could see that these are more centered with a little bit of space in between them versus being spread out to the edges of their container. So I can accomplish that by going back to the group and let's again rename our group here, um, already have account. And the layout, I'm gonna change this to a center alignment and add a little bit of gap spacing. Um, let's say maybe 10 pixels between them, maybe a little bit more, 20 pixels between them. Uh, so that they stay centered, but you know, can then move outward from there. Okay, so now we can adjust our settings, uh, our, our space settings and um, distribution and, and kind of get more consistent in our widths with our form here. First thing I'm gonna do is have the group itself, the group form, um, fit its height to the content. So I wanna remove the minimum height, but now I wanna create some padding on the inner uh, like sides of this group so that um, everything inside can essentially stretch out but then be pushed in so we have some border that's created. Let, let me show you what I mean a little bit better here. I'm gonna actually remove um, from each of these groups the fit width to content setting. Okay, remove that. You see how it extends all the way to the width of the container. Um, I'm also gonna get rid of the minimum. Same thing here for password, remove fixed width. Same thing for the individual um, inputs, remove all of these fixed width settings so that it all stretches out. It's fully, fully dynamic. Same thing for this group. And I'll tell you why that I'm doing this and not just creating independent um, like margin settings uh, here. We're basically going to help ourselves make it easier to create consistency. So remove all of this. Okay, all I'm doing is removing the fit width to content and removing any minimum width. So everything is fully stretched out. Now, this group, I can come in and create some padding. Let's say we do 20 pixels of padding all the way around. Okay, now I have like a border essentially that has been created there. And, and because everything was stretched out, now we have much more consistent widths of everything. Um, at the group level, I'm also going to finally add in my gap spacing. Maybe we do 20 pixels of gap spacing as well. Okay, now it's starting to look a little bit better. I'm also gonna add a little bit of space between the input label and the input itself. So at that container level, okay, we're gonna add a gap spacing here. Maybe we do 10 pixels. Okay, same thing here for the group password, add 10 pixels. Okay, so now we're getting much more spacing in, uh, in, in this form overall. One thing that I'm noticing is that both of these groups, they are top aligned on the page. You see that I have this extra space down here at the page. Now, page heights are gonna be dynamic because different devices are gonna be different heights. If you're on a mobile device, it's gonna be smaller. If you're on a much larger monitor, it could be a lot taller, you have more space. What I wanna do is just ensure that this group is always centered um, 
uh, on the page for the user when they load their page. So this group left, what I'm going to do is change the vertical alignment away from the top aligned and have it stretch, which means it's going to expand to the full height of the page, whatever that height is. And again, because this group left is an aligned to parent style, which means that the form here is at the center, it's just going to recenter itself. This is fully stretched to the page, and this is just going to stay centered. We're going to do the same thing with the blue group on the right, vertical stretch. Okay, so I'm going to close that so you can see what this looks like. Now we are starting to have our, our sign up form nice and organized. Um, I promise the more you work with this, the faster you'll go through building out these things. I've obviously been talking through every, every single step of the way, but this is a kind of form that you can actually build quite quickly once you get the hang of all of the settings and all of the adjustments that need to be made. And also the shortcuts that you'll pick up for yourself for copying and pasting so you don't have to redo more than you really need. All right, so looks like we're looking pretty good here in terms of our, um, let me turn off the borders again in terms of our form, oh, it's this one here, All right? Nice and clean, very evenly distributed, even widths. Um, the only thing that I'm missing here is my image. So let me go ahead and add a new image element. And we're gonna do this in the center non-ent of my group. Let me go back to layout, center right there. And under the appearance setting, I'm just gonna paste in that URL. So you can do that with images that are hosted elsewhere, or you can upload a new image or your images can even come from your database. Lots of different options for you. Okay, so this image looks like it's pretty good um, in terms of you know, the aspect ratio and, and being displayed there. I'm gonna make a couple of adjustments though. Um, I'm gonna have this aspect ratio fixed so that it's a perfect square. And because of that, now I can change the dimensions of that square. If I make it bigger, let's say 400 pixels, Right now the image is a lot bigger, it's 400 by 400. If I go to 200, it's a lot smaller. Let's go back to maybe 300, yeah, that feels okay. All right, so here we have it. There's our design for the form on the left, the image on the right, um, using all of the responsive settings so that everything is very neatly organized and consistent on the page. Um, let's go ahead and set up the workflow uh, to complete the whole process and see our new user get created in the database. So as a reminder, going back to the data types under the user data type, your email address field is built in. You do not need to create another email field. Also, you know, might notice that there's no password field. That is intentional. It's hidden from you. You will not be able to see the passwords of your users. Bubble secures that. So we actually don't need to add anything extra to our data structure, but if I wanted to collect for example, a name. Let's just go ahead and add that in here to our form. So we're veering away from our original design, but that's okay. So let's do um, up here at the top, let's collect a name. And this input is going to be just a regular text so that they can type in their name. And I'm gonna make sure to change the input name here so um, we can identify it. So this is name input, email, and password. Okay, so that way we'll have something to save to the built-in email field, the hidden built-in password, and also this custom field called name. Okay, so let's start our workflow. When this button is clicked, okay, I'm gonna open up the property editor for this button and begin a workflow by clicking on this here, start edit workflow. When this button is clicked, we're gonna add some action, right? So in our workflow section, we have our triggers, our events, in other words, and our actions. If this, then that. And the action can be one action, it can be a series of actions, um, and you have a number of different events that you can work with, a number of different triggers. What we're working with is an element trigger, when a specific element is clicked. And I could have built this from scratch here by going to that event and then selecting my button. You'll notice that all of my visual elements that I've designed on my page are now available to me. Um, that's kind of the long way around. Um, a lot of your visual elements will have this option here to begin a workflow when it is clicked. Okay, so when my button is clicked, I want to sign up my user. So this is an account action. Lots of different account actions available to you. You can change credentials, you can reset passwords, you can actually create accounts for other people. Um, so like an admin person can create a user account for somebody else. You can sign up with social networks. Uh, those will involve plugins if you're gonna do that. Um, yeah, and logging your user in, logging them out. If we take a look through some of these other categories, I mean, the they're broken down into the most common pieces of functionality. So navigation, moving a user from one page to another, 
or working with your database, creating records, updating records, deleting them. You can export your data, um, sending emails, right? Payments here. The only reason we have actions here is because I have a Stripe plugin in, uh, installed into this application. By default, you're not going to see anything here. Um, but with the Stripe plugin, we can trigger all sorts of Stripe actions, creating subscriptions, making a payment, all of that. Um, element actions are more of those visual things on the page. So they don't really involve the database. It's more like I want to show a pop-up or show an alert message um, or reset my input so that they go back to being blank, right? A lot of things you can do there. If you are installing plugins that extend functionality, they may introduce more actions here. It just depends on what you have installed in your app. And then we have a couple of uh, custom things that are a little bit more advanced. So all we want to do with this sign up is sign the user up. And you can see that Bubble is asking me for some required information, this stuff in red. Notice that I'm not doing any code. I'm just filling out the action settings as, as they're you know, requiring me to. The email is going to be whatever the user typed into that email input. So this is uh, your dynamic expression composer. Whenever you can insert dynamic data, this is where you find information from your page, whether they're coming from inputs, um, or like a file uploader or something, or from your database. Um, we'll touch on this a lot more throughout the next demonstrations, but essentially what we're seeing here are the list of possible input sources, data sources, to insert here so that Bubble knows to sign the user up with this email. Pretty straightforward in our case, we just want to insert the value of the email input. Um, now, here's an issue. Two of our inputs are called the exact same thing. This is why we have to label our inputs properly. So let's just double check. I know I renamed this one input name. This one is input email address. This one is uh, our password has not, not been renamed. So let's rename it to input password. That way we can keep them apart. We don't run into any issues in the workflow. Okay, so here's our input email addresses value. There's a couple of other properties here, but we want to go to the value of that input, whatever the user typed in. Same thing for the password. Okay. If I had introduced another password field so they could retype their password just for confirmation, make sure there wasn't a typo, I could have Bubble require that and I would provide that second password inputs uh, value here. Um, I can choose to send an email to the user in order for them to confirm. Bubble will automatically send an email. Um, the language of that email is actually managed in your settings and Bubble will include a, a one-time use link uh, for you so that when the user clicks on it, Bubble's going to mark them internally as confirmed. That's kind of a built-in piece of functionality that you can take advantage of. And then the remember the email is just so that when the user comes back to this page, the input will uh, fill in with their email address. It's just kind of storing that information based off of cookies. So this is just looking for a yes or no value. We have provided a checkbox in the form and a checkbox uh, essentially outputs a yes or no value, right? It's either checked or unchecked. It's Boolean, it's true or false. Um, so the way that we'll capture whatever the user chose is we'll reference that checkbox um, that checkbox element, you can see that we don't have the equivalent here of these inputs. We don't have checkboxes value. Instead, we have two different ways of looking at whether the checkbox is checked or not. Checkbox is checked. We could do it that way or checkbox isn't checked. What's really happening here is Bubble is making a true or false statement. This, this is either going to be true or false, right? So if we say, okay, the checkbox is checked. That is either um, uh, true, right? If the user has checked the box, then this is a true statement. Bubble will set this value to yes. I want to remember the email. If the user left the checkbox unchecked, this is a false statement. And so the expression will evaluate to a no value. Remember the email? No, right? Because they left it unchecked. It's a little weird with checkboxes to get their values in there, but that's how you want to do it. Now we do want to update another field on the user record at the same time. So I clicked on this here so that I can map the name input to the name field in the user record. This is one of my custom fields that I created in my data structure. The name is going to equal the value of the input names, uh, that, that element there, that element's value. Okay, so 
From one button click, Bubble is going to create a user account for the record. For the, ooh, I said that very backwards. Bubble is going to create a record for the user and uh, save their email, password, and their name, and this checkbox setting all in one go. So now that we've signed the user up, that's gonna happen behind the scenes. The user record will be there, but on the front end, the user who's actually doing this, nothing's gonna change for them. Visually, it's gonna seem like it's broken, actually. Remember, you have to tell Bubble absolutely everything you want to happen. So let's do a couple things. Let's uh, first reset the group so that it clears out all of the inputs. Um, there's actually two ways to do this. We could reset the group, the, the form, um, which will take all of the inputs back to their default state. So they were all empty by default. Or I can say reset inputs, which will only clear inputs that were involved in the workflow. Um, and we happen to have them all involved here. So this will also clear them out. So that's one kind of very subtle visual indicator to the user. They click on the button and the in inputs will clear out back to empty. Another more helpful indicator is to actually show an alert message or a pop-up um, that says, hey, uh, you know, check your email. We sent you a confirmation link or you are signed up, welcome. Or maybe even navigating them away from this page and going directly to another page, to a dashboard, to a user settings page, however you want that flow to go. We're gonna keep this simple. I'm gonna add an alert message um, to the page. We're just gonna do it at the page level. And I'll put the alert at the top so that it's just centered there. And we can say, you are now signed up like this. The way that alerts work are that they are hidden by default and you have to show them in a workflow. So this is not going to be present when we first load the page. But in our workflow, what we're gonna do is go to this element action, show alert message, and Bubble's going to automatically select that element because it's the only alert we have designed on the page. If I had more, then I would be able to choose. And I can control the timing of this alert. Again, it's hidden by default, and when we show it in the workflow, it will fade in, hold, and then fade out. So I can control the timing here. It's in milliseconds. So right now, by default, it's set to fade in for half a second, hold for two, fade out half a second. All right, let's try it out. I'm going to preview my page here and we're gonna sign up a new user and check our database and make sure that it was created properly. Okay, notice that when I clicked on preview, um, the debugger was added automatically. Essentially, this is a way for you to troubleshoot um, your, your designs, to troubleshoot your conditions. Uh, this is a way for you to inspect your elements, essentially. So I can, this toolbar down here is the debugger. I can hit inspect select any one of my you know, elements, and it's gonna give me all the properties for this element. I can see what things are in real time. Very, very helpful for troubleshooting. What I'm gonna do for now though, is remove the debugger from the URL, which will turn off that little toolbar at the bottom. Um, the debugger also adds a little bit of extra white space, and I just want to be able to preview this page without it. So here's our design. I think our image is a little bit smaller than our original. Actually, let me toggle back and forth. There's our original. Here's the new one. It looks like I had the form a bit more narrow compared to the uh, original, but hopefully you were able to follow along with where those settings would have happened for increasing the width a little bit um, or increasing the size of this image. Okay, so let's say we sign up Jane Doe, Jane at sample.com and we're gonna use a password um, and I'll say, um, remember me and we'll click on sign up. Okay, so it's triggering the workflow. You see, there's my alert message up at the top. Uh, my form completely cleared out. So it's a good visual indicator. I had two visual indicators to the user that it was successful. In reality, uh, you know, I wouldn't want the user to just kind of be stuck here if there's no confirmation. If I was gonna require confirmation, I would say, go check your inbox so that they can go do that because the link will take them to a page of your definition uh, once they have confirmed and then they can move on from there. Um, or I would automatically redirect them um, at the end of the workflow, just run a go to page action and take them away. So they're, they're not stuck here. Uh, you can ignore this. This is just a Chrome extension that I have installed that has nothing to do with uh, what I designed here. So a good practice whenever you're creating data for the first time after setting up a new workflow or modifying data is to check your database and confirm that everything got created as expected. Now, again, we're not gonna be able to see the password um, under app data, 
here are my users. So this was the newest user that I created. There's the email, there's the name, and we know we have our user in the system, which is fantastic. Okay, so that same process you'll be able to go through with any other data type. Now this is a simple workflow, creating one record, doing just a couple of things after, but you can absolutely build more comprehensive things um, you know, when it comes to user interaction in the application, you can have a big sequence of actions, you can trigger other workflows, you can uh, work with multiple records at a time in a single workflow, modifying many things at once or having things dependent on previous actions. Um, and we'll get into some of that here with our next demonstrations. Last thing I just wanted to go through was some of the responsive settings. Remember, I had placed um, in my original a condition to have this entire right side hide once we're on a smaller screen. So let's take a look at what how things are set up right now with the current settings in our responsive viewer. So if I just drag this in to see what will happen, things will start to squish. Like this is not something that I want to happen. I want this blue group to go away um, earlier than this, I think. Right? Otherwise, we end up with this kind of collapsing behavior or this overlapping behavior. So let's add a condition to this group here. Okay, I'm going to go to the conditional tab and I'm going to say when the current page width, creating my conditional expression, I can find the current page's width. This is a built-in value that Bubble makes available to us. When this width is, let's say, less than uh, maybe 700 pixels. That would be a pretty large uh, smartphone. So if we're, you know, approaching a normal size smartphone, um, we want this to go away. So less than 700 pixels, I'm going to change the visibility property of the entire right group and make it not visible. I'm going to leave this unchecked. If we go to the layout tab, you'll notice that by default, every element you add to your design is going to be visible on page load. So you can change that if you want that behavior to be the opposite. Maybe by default, you want it to be hidden. So you would uncheck this. I am also going to collapse this group down when it is hidden. So if we are less than 700 pixels, I want to make this hidden, which will mean that the height of the height of this group is going to fully collapse down. This is a good practice because if I had other elements designed on the page, I don't want to end up with a big gap just kind of hanging out there where this group would be. Collapsing things down basically means it fully disappears and things can shift around and take up that space. Again, depends on your design. You might not want that in certain situations, but um, just be mindful of that setting as well. So now if I go back to my responsive view and we, we can see here that we're at, uh, let's see, 899 pixels. I'm just gonna slowly move down till we approach 700. I might even need to do this before then. But oh, there we go. Now let's do it maybe before, oh, no, I think that's fine. But what we do want to do is center. Okay, so if we're at this piece here, which is kind of like a, uh, kind of close to a horizontal mobile or like a larger, a larger um, vertical uh, portrait mode. What I want this uh, group to do is center itself. So if I, I can open up the settings from here as well. Um, so let's see why this one is not centering. Let's go to the row. Ah, right. Okay. So at the page level, remember we set this in a row container alignment style and our container layout style and everything, our row is uh, left aligned. So we have the white group and then right next to it is the, the blue group. Um, but what I can do instead is have it center. So when they're both there, we don't really see a difference. But when the blue group is gone, this one is the only element in the row and it's going to remain centered on the page. Right? If I change this to right aligned, you can see the difference here. So this setting helps me keep things nice and, and, and centered on that page, even with the blue group there. When the blue group comes back, it's back to normal like this. Okay, so this 320 preset. Okay, so we can see how things are getting really squished here. And that's because this form has no minimum width. We're allowing it to squish down very, very tiny. Let's maybe give it a minimum of 300 pixels. Let's try that. That looks a little bit better. By the way, 320 is on the smaller end for smartphones. Most smartphones these days are a bit bigger than this. But if we know that things look good, we can see everything, nothing's getting cut off, nothing's getting squished or overlapped, then we're in a safe zone um, for viewing uh, these designs. So if I start at 320 and kind of work my way back out, you can see that it starts to expand because we haven't met the uh, the max width settings. 
right? And I can really play around with that. There's a lot of different variables that have to all work together, as you can see, to get really good looking responsive design. 